everybody, and uh, welcome. So glad, glad to see you all here. Uh, I'm Alice Cooper, the director of the library. I know most of you, but I know we have a few new people, so welcome. I just wanted to mention, uh, this is our penultimate program. Next Sunday, May 1st, will be Lives Bound Together, Slavery at George Washington's Mount Vernon with Dr. Susan P. Schulwer, PhD, who's Executive Director of Historic Preservation and Collections, and Robert H. Smith, Senior Curator at George Washington's Mount Vernon. So we will end with a bang. Yeah. I wanted to mention that uh, our library is in the midst of a strategic planning um, project. And right now we are asking the community to fill out a brief survey. We have several of them here at the table. So you're welcome to fill it out in paper form. Otherwise, it's available online on our website. I would also like to give a sincere thank you to the Sundays at 2 committee, the members who are here today. Uh, normally, this program has six programs, but uh, we had the opportunity of having Dr. Santer here today, so we added a seventh. So our committee has given up seven Sunday afternoons, and uh, I really appreciate it. So here today from the committee, if they would stand up in the back row, <laughs> uh, we have Sandy Toomey, Susan McCune, and Sheila Stetka. Many of you, I'm sure, also know uh, Shelly Robertson, who's our technology director. She definitely keeps us all straight. <laughs> and I would like to give a sincere thank you to Bud Ward, who uh, came to us with the opportunity of having Dr. Santer speak today. Uh, Bud lives locally, but also lives large, I would say. Um, he's an environmental journalist and editor of the Yale Climate Connections. And he will introduce our speaker today. So thank you. Thank you, Alice, and thank you all for giving up a beautiful Sunday. I think you'll find it worthwhile. I'm confident you will. Uh, I have the real pleasure to introduce a person. Now, you're expecting me to say a person who? I'm just going to leave it at that uh, to introduce a person. Because uh, Ben Sander is, first and foremost, a person, a human being. Yes, he's a scientist. Yes, he's a climate scientist. And yes, he's without question one of the most revered climate scientists in the United States and in the world. No lie, in the United States and in the world, top five. Uh, ben is uh, most highly regarded by his colleagues as an ardent defender of sound science, scientific principles, and that's his passion. His only goal in life was to be a scientist which he accomplished uh, spades over. Uh, in the midst of doing that, um, he became uh, recognized as a strong defender of, uh, of science per se. Uh, ben, very briefly, is a MacArthur Foundation genius grant recipient. If you know that, uh, that's something. I read on the internet that that was the same year that I was runner-up. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't hold that against I don't hold that against him. Um, ben uh, also is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and you know the, the significance of that. He's been an author for the uh, UN and the uh, World Health Organization uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's IPCC. You've all heard about it and continue to hear about it. He is the author, the single author most identified with IPCC's, that's the International Scientific Community's, first recognition that one, climate change is happening, and two, that it's us, it's humans. That's basically the quick synopsis of the findings in 1995, 96, that Ben was the principal negotiator, and uh, the person most identified, for better and worse, with that language. It was considered at the time by the scientific community to be a very conservative, um, very conservative statement. But 
politically, it was dynamite. And it's proved to be that. Um, I don't know how many of you caught the Tuesday night frontline, PBS frontline. Did anyone see it? Several people. Um, we're going to make available a, the show. Uh, so you can either send Alice or me an email as they send me the link so you can see the first installment. PBS and Frontline have started a special series. It's a heavy lift. It's three specials each 90 minutes. So it's, it's a heavy lift. The first installment was this past Tuesday. I can send you the URL if you give me an email address and want it. Uh, you can look at it at your leisure. The next two Tuesdays, it'll be on 10 o'clock on your PBS station. Uh, installment two on t uh, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Installment three the following Tuesday. Uh, yes, Alice. But I'm sorry. Um, Shelly and I talked, and we'll make it available on the library website and on our Facebook page as well. Great. So Terrific, can. Alice. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Uh, ben had, Ben's research is front and center of that first installment from the first minute, basically. Uh, and his role in it personally uh, comes in big time around 50 or 60 minutes into this first uh, installment. But I hope you get a chance to see it. It's historically significant. This is a great historical record of why, in the opinion of the editors of the PBS Frontline, we, humanity, haven't done our share to take care of the problem. That's basically the subtitle. Also, uh, on the 11th of this month, BBC aired a, 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 a podcast. It's available if you, uh, if from your app store, just download BBC Sounds. Uh, that will give you access to BBC programming if you put in Ben Santer. Uh, they, on April 11th, uh, aired a documentary, uh, basically the life of a climate scientist. And it's by no coincidence that they chose Ben Santer to profile in that particular one. I think it's a shadow of the first installment of Frontline, which was amazing, but it's good. But don't miss Frontline. If you get a chance, BBC Sounds will bring you to the BBC documentary. Nothing more to say. Ben Center. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Bud. I had been threatening to visit Bud and Kathy here for many, many years. I finally followed through on my threat, and I'm just so delighted to be here today in your community and to have the opportunity to spend maybe three quarters of an hour talking to you about the science of climate change. So to start off with, uh, I apologize. I got the um, <clears throat> Lancaster Public Library should be community library. What an extraordinary community that stands up a library like this. <clears throat> I wish we had one where I live. This isn't just a pretty picture. This is the amount of water vapor in Earth's atmosphere on a particular day. And it's actually the day that Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Uh, and these beautiful filaments of water vapor, these are called atmospheric rivers. There's one about to slam into the Pacific Northwest. You can see here these magenta blobs are typhoons spinning away in the Western Pacific. And what this illustrates is that since the late 1970s, we've had the ability as scientists to monitor global scale changes in Earth's climate in things like water vapor temperature from space in order to determine how our climate is changing. And we'll get back to this picture a little bit later. Uh, water vapor is one of the things we look at as climate scientists to try and determine how it's changing and whether those changes are in accord with how we think climate should be changing in response to human changes in levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So a little bit about myself. I'm an atmospheric scientist. Uh, my education was in the United Kingdom and in Germany. I was born in Washington, D.C., but my folks moved from um, <clears throat> Washington, D.C. to Dortmund in Germany in 1966. I went to a British Army school where I was the only kid who 
couldn't play soccer or rugby, cricket. <laughs> um, I had to learn pretty quickly. I was the other, and that experience of being the other and being different influenced me profoundly. <clears throat> My research, as Bud mentioned, is fingerprinting the climate system, so trying to use pattern information to separate human and natural effects on climate. My hobby and my real passion is going rock climbing with my son, Nick. So this is Nick at beautiful Joshua Tree National Park just a couple of months ago. When he was younger, I would lead and he would follow. Now the roles are reversed. <laughs> and I try and follow him. He's at the sharp end of the rope. But I'm very grateful for um, his persuasive powers. About five years ago, he persuaded me to unretire from rock climbing and to join him on all kinds of adventures. So what are we gonna cover today? Very briefly, I'll give you a primer. What is climate fingerprinting? You may have heard that at the end of 2021, uh, two famous climate scientists won part of the Nobel Prize for Physics. And both of those scientists have links to climate fingerprinting. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about those links today. Then I'm gonna give you some uh, brief examples of how one uses pattern information to try and separate human and natural effects on climate. One example will be with temperature in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And then we're going to look at uh, other aspects of climate change, like the water vapor slide that I showed you uh, originally. And finally, as Bud mentioned, back in 1995, like it or not, I was the convening lead author of one particular chapter of the second assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That report uh, reached the finding that humans were influencing global climate and that we could indeed, back in 1995, formally identify a human-caused signal that had emerged from the background noise of natural climate variability. Uh, that was a bad time for me personally. After that report was published, there were a lot of people and companies and countries unhappy with that finding, and I learned some powerful lessons, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of those lessons here. Climate Fingerprinting 101. <clears throat> but mentioned the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. They were set up in 1988 by the United Nations Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. Why? To advise the countries of the world what we know about the physical climate system, what we know about the impacts of climate change on things we care about, human health, agriculture, <coughs> energy and also mitigation and adaptation <coughs> strategies. So how might we uh, decide to adapt to uh, climate change that is inevitable, but also mitigate the worst effects of human-caused climate change that uh, we are responsible for. Their first report was published in 1990, and it essentially reached the bottom line conclusion that the jury is still out. I'll read it here. The unequivocal detection of the enhanced greenhouse effect from observations is not likely for a decade or more. That was 1990. 1995, this is the report that I was involved with, and the bottom line finding could be summarized in 12 words, which are forever engraved in my memory. Quote, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. <clears throat> That was, as we'll get back to later, controversial. It was also historic. And subsequent IPCC assessments in 2001, 2007, and 2013 by different and independent sets of scientists affirmed and strengthened that cautious, even wimpy, balance of evidence suggests finding and try to quantify the size of the human effect on climate. Most recently, in 2021, October 2021, the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change used this word unequivocal. It is now unequivocal that human fingerprints are evident in the land, in the ocean, in the atmosphere. 
So part of my job today is to tell you about this arc of history. How did we get from the jury is out in 1990 to unequivocal human fingerprints on the climate system in 2021? What was the scientific underpinning for that arc of history? Quick question. Yes. So you mentioned 1970s, beginning with the use of satellites to pull data that you could study. Late 1970s. Late 1970s. So you're looking at about, what, 15, 20 years? Well, 10? No. Not very many years between the satellites and the beginnings of these reports. So the science that was being done at that point um, is what is the beginning of what drove, what started. It's part of it. So yeah. prior to the beginning of the satellite record, mm -hmm. which is late 1970s, mm -hmm. much of the satellite data I'm going to talk about started in November 1978. You have surface temperature measurements at uh, hundreds, thousands of locations around the world. Some of those go back to the 1900s. Some of those, particularly at European cities, go back for hundreds of years before that. Think Rome, think um, Kew Garden in the UK. So there is measurement information from individual stations, primarily in the Northern Hemisphere, about surface temperature changes that goes back to the 1880s. And indeed, not only about temperature, but about surface pressure patterns, uh, about rainfall that is also available at individual locations. But what happened in the late 70s was this transition from local and regional measurements of climate to truly global scale estimates of climate change. Plus the use of computers to punch. Yeah, which is what I'm going to get to here. But thank you for um, um, clarifying that. And we'll get to we'll get to the satellite data a little bit later. So again, how did we get from the jury is out to unequivocal fingerprints? Back in the 1990s, uh, there were a few computer models of the climate system, maybe only less than a half of a dozen that were being used around the world. And most of them were relatively primitive, particularly in their representation of the ocean and the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere, how oceans take up heat when the atmosphere warms and how oceans release heat in different ocean basins during El Ninos and La Ninas. Now, today, pretty much every country, uh, every major country in the world has its own computer models of the climate system. These are much improved relative to the 1990s. These have representation not only of the oceans and the atmosphere and sea ice, but also ice sheets. Think Antarctica, think the Greenland ice sheet. Also the carbon cycle and how uh, the land biosphere, for example, trees and plants uh, interact with carbon in the atmosphere, how the oceans and ocean biogeochemistry interacts with uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases. So these are, uh, as we call them now, Earth system models. They try and simulate all important components of the climate system. We have a better understanding now in 2021, 2022, of the factors that influence climate. Back in 1990, scientists were primarily concerned just with fossil fuel burning and human-caused changes in levels of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping greenhouse gases. Now we have a much richer understanding of particulate pollution, for example, of human impacts on stratospheric ozone through chlorofluorocarbons that we produce, of the effects of changes in land surface properties, think large scale deforestation of the Amazon, of widespread irrigation. And we also have a better understanding of purely natural factors like changes in the sun's energy output that we've also monitored from space since the late 1970s, as I'll show you later. Getting back to your point, we have longer climate records. One of the justifiable criticisms back in 1995 of the IPCC second assessment report and this cautious discernible human influence finding was 
satellite records are 17 years long. And that's not long enough to reliably pull out some true global scale signal. Now the satellite record is 42 years long and we have a much better handle on signal, so any warming that has occurred and the fluctuations in climate that occur just due to natural variability in the climate system. And it turns out that that longer record has been critical in separating signal and noise. Um, back at the time I started work in this area in 1987 at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg, uh, we didn't have community-wide analysis of satellite data or of climate model uh, simulation output. Individual groups would do their own thing. They weren't very successful at sharing data. In 1992, I moved to Lawrence Livermore National Lab in Livermore in California and worked at a group called the Program for Climate Model Diagnosis and Intercomparison. And our job was to put the verification of computer models of the climate system on a firm and rigorous scientific footing to benchmark these computer models to get every modeling group in the world to perform the same simulations. And importantly, when they had done that, to share the output with the entire world scientific community. In a sense, it was the beginning of crowdsourcing. And what that enabled is more eyeballs, more analysts looking at satellite data, at model simulation output, and ultimately that led to better climate models. The Department of Energy also developed this infrastructure something called the Earth System Grid Federation for efficiently sharing <clears throat> petabytes of simulation output and satellite data so that from the comfort of your home, you could interrogate all of the world's climate models and their simulation output. Um, revolutionary. And finally, there was climate fingerprinting that I think also enabled this arc of history and led to the finding of unambiguous fingerprints in 2021. So what is climate fingerprinting? The basic idea is that different influences on climate, the sun, volcanoes, human-caused greenhouse gas changes from fossil fuel burning, have different characteristic patterns of response. And those differences are easier to discern if you look beyond, say, one number, the global mean temperature of Earth's surface, and look at these complex altitudinal patterns, say, through the entire vertical extent of the Earth's atmosphere, or, as I'll show you, patterns through the depths of the oceans. When you look at pattern information, it's like in fingerprinting. You can more easily separate different categories of thing, and that's in fingerprinting, there are these different categories, loops and whorls and arches and various subcategories. And forensic scientists look at this kind of information in order to get information about whether someone could or could not be responsible, be culpable for something bad. I'm gonna give you a quick example here. So this is a slice through the Earth's atmosphere. And we're looking from the North Pole to the South Pole and we're looking from uh, close to the Earth's surface right up to 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Now this is a computer model calculation from our colleagues at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder in Colorado. And the beauty of computer model simulation is you can do what Einstein called Gedanken experiment, thought experiments. You can use a model to do the thing that you can't do in the real world. So what did they do here? They just changed the sun's energy output in this climate model according to our best understanding of how the sun's energy output had actually changed. And we think that over the 20th century, there's been a slight uptick in the sun's energy output, which essentially means more sunlight arriving at the top of the atmosphere and heating, which is why you see these yellow to red colors here, throughout the full vertical extent of the atmosphere. Now there's a little blue here over the poles. The poles are noisy 
And this increase in the sun's energy output is thought to be very small. So it's not a big signal, which is why you get a noise, um, <clears throat> noise here at the North Pole and at the South Pole. But the bottom line is, this is the fingerprint of a slight uptick in the sun's energy output, according to this particular model. And you can use the same model to look at the fingerprints not only of the sun, but of natural changes in volcanic activity. Think big eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, of human-caused changes in greenhouse gases, of human-caused particulate pollution, of human-caused changes in ozone. And I'm not going to get into the details of each one of these little um, <clears throat> postage-sized fingerprints. The point is, the take-home message is they're different simulations, not just with this model, show that different influences on climate have different characteristic signatures, and looking at patterns helps you to see those differences, and ultimately to disentangle natural and human effects on climate in the observations. All right, the Nobel Prize. How does this work intersect with the recent Nobel Prize? So uh, this gentleman here, this distinguished looking gentleman who looks a little bit like Kenny Rogers, uh, <laughs> is Professor ha Klaus Hassemann. Uh, at the time, I went to the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg in 1987. He was one of the three directors. And uh, he had written a paper back in 1979 in an obscure conference proceedings outlining this method that electrical engineers use to identify coherent signals embedded in noisy data. Because it turns out that electrical engineers do this all the time, signal detection. And Hasselmann's idea was, let's borrow from what they do in order to search for warming signals or other kinds of signals embedded in noisy climate data. And that was the job he gave me when I went to Hamburg in 1987. Just as an aside, um, on one flight from Frankfurt to Denver, he was actually mistaken for Kenny Rogers, <laughs> and we were bumped up to business class. <laughs> this never happened to me uh, again. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is from the announcement of the Nobel Prize Committee in October 2021. Uh, Klaus received the Nobel Prize uh, quote, for methods for identifying specific signals, fingerprints, that both natural phenomena and human activities imprint in the climate. So what was his key insight? Here you see two patterns again. These are from computer model simulations. The first pattern is when you use, I think in this case, nearly 30 different computer models of the climate system, and you increase in them heat trapping greenhouse gases and the lower atmosphere warms which is what you see on the top panel here and you get more warming over the northern hemisphere than over the southern hemisphere which is why you see more reds up here that's in part because of the retreat of arctic sea ice and snow as you warm which we can get into uh, later you can also see there's more warming over land than over ocean Turns out that land is easier to warm than ocean for the same energy input. Uh, and this pattern here is when you use the same models, but you perform so-called control runs with them. What are those? Those are simulations where there are no changes in greenhouse gases or particulate pollution. The models just simulate their own rich internal variability of the climate system think things like the El Ninos and La Ninas. And in fact, that's what you see here. This pattern uh, is very reminiscent of the impact of El Nino on the temperature of the atmosphere. What Hasselmann realized was that up to 1979 and the early 80s, people were not looking at patterns. They were looking at individual locations. So if you look up here in Alaska, there's a lot of warming up here in these model simulations. But the noise of natural climate variability is much larger than the signal. 
noise kills if you're trying to identify some signal. But if you move beyond the local here and look at the entire pattern, then it's obvious these are now satellite observations, so not computer model calculations, but satellite observations of warming over pretty much the full satellite era, 1979 through to 2018. The satellite data show many of the features that we see in the human influence fingerprint. More warming over the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, particularly large warming over the Arctic. Uh, and it's clear, even without doing the fancy statistics that we do, that the search for human influence fingerprint is far more similar uh, to the satellite observations uh, than it is to this pattern of natural climate variability. Yes? Okay, forgive me. No, go so, ahead. So one of the things that, that jumps out at me about human fingerprint, I've never thought about this before, what is the population of the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere? And I would suspect there is a lot more people in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. Well, I think you're right. There are a lot more people in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. But carbon dioxide is fairly <coughs> well mixed in the atmosphere. So there isn't a big distinction in carbon dioxide in northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere. For other greenhouse gases, like methane, for example, that's not the case. But carbon dioxide is, is pretty homogeneously distributed in the Earth's atmosphere. Is that? that? No, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to think about. So. Yeah. Anyway, you get the point I'm trying to make here that Hasselmann's um, simple insight was don't look, as other people had done, at individual locations on the Earth's surface. Take a step back and look at the entire pattern. And that will make it easier to discern whether there's some similarity between this search for human influence fingerprint and the actual observations. <clears throat> then we get to this gentleman, uh, Suki Manabi, uh, one of the founders of climate modeling, uh, still affiliated with the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton. And he was awarded one third of the 2021 Nobel Physics Prize for physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability, and reliably predicting global warming. So what did he do? <clears throat> in a very uh, historic paper published in 1967 with his colleague Richard Weatherall, also at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, they used a simple climate model, which basically just looked at different layers of the atmosphere, but only looked at global average temperature. And they increased atmospheric CO2. Um, they they went uh, to quadrupling, basically, 150 to 300 to 600 parts per million. And when they did that, they saw that the lower atmosphere warmed, the atmosphere more effectively tracked heat lower down, less heat reached the upper atmosphere, so the upper atmosphere cooled. Now, importantly, this is predictive. So this is before the satellite data in the late 1970s. This paper is 1967. We do have some weather balloon measurements of atmospheric temperature, but back then, in the 60s, most weather balloons don't have the structural integrity to get above about 20, 25 kilometers. They burst. So we don't really know what's happening up there. This was a true prediction, and one of the things our group did when I moved to Livermore uh, in 1992 was to look at this prediction, to look at whether Suki Manabi and Dick Weatherall were, were right. And that's what we're going to get to now, very briefly. So this is global mean temperature. So this is an average, literally, of millions of land surface thermometer measurements over oceans, ships of opportunity, uh, buoys, more recently, satellite data. And this group is now called the National Center for Environmental Information. They're in Asheville in North Carolina. There are about three or four other groups that try and compile these estimates of global scale changes in, in surface temperature. And this, like all the other groups, shows warming of roughly 
two degrees Fahrenheit since 1880, uh, about 1.1 degrees Celsius. And one of the claims that I frequently hear, and I'm sure you have too, is that this warming is real, but it's all natural. It's all due to some uptake in the sun's energy output. So how might fingerprinting help us to address that claim and see whether it's a reasonable claim or not? Obviously, this isn't drawn to scale. This is a sort of Homer Simpson view of the universe. Here, my apologies. And in particular, it's a Homer Simpson view of the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. But just suspend your disbelief for a minute and imagine if this claim that all of that surface warming I just showed you is due to a more active sun. What is the logical, inescapable consequence of assuming that thing? More active sun, more sunlight arriving at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, and like in that sun-only fingerprint I, I showed you earlier, you'd expect to see heating throughout the full vertical extent of the atmosphere. So the next question is, when we look through the atmosphere, what do the satellite data actually show us? Do they show this kind of sun-only fingerprint or not? Since November 1978, we have these beautiful microwave sounder measurements of atmospheric temperature. These are measurements from um, polar orbiting satellites, and they look at the microwave emissions from oxygen molecules. And those emissions depend on uh, different temperatures of the atmosphere, different layer temperatures, and by measuring the different microwave frequencies, you can back out the temperature of the lower atmosphere, mid-atmosphere, mid the, the stratosphere, and reconstruct the vertical uh, pattern of temperature change, which is what you see here. There are about four groups around the world that do this complex work. This is from a group in California called Remote Sensing Systems. And again, we're looking at a slice through the atmosphere, but now in the satellite data, importantly, not in computer model simulations, we're looking from the South Pole to the North Pole, and this is virtually over the entire 42-year uh, satellite record. I didn't have time to add 2021 to this, but the kicker, the, the take-home message is that this pattern of temperature change is consistent with a prediction made by Manabe and Weatherold over 50 years ago. It shows warming low down, with largest warming over the Arctic, where we've seen this uh, nearly 50% decrease in the extent of Arctic sea ice and the thickness of Arctic sea ice. And it shows cooling of the upper atmosphere, with largest cooling over Antarctica, where we've depleted uh, Antarctic ozone through production of chlorofluorocarbons. So this pattern is fundamentally inconsistent with the hypothesis that all of the surface warming I showed you, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit since 1880, is due to an uptick in the sun. The next time someone says it's all due to the sun, I would ask you to um, ask them, well, why is the stratosphere cooling then if all of the surface warming is due to the sun? But of course, we don't only look at one thing, at one piece of evidence. We would be remiss as scientists if we did that. So in addition to this kind of fingerprint evidence, um, and we, we found the Manabe predicted fingerprint both in weather balloon data in 1996 and in satellite data in 2013. But additionally, we also look at other, what you might call complementary variables, which is what you see here. So this red line, these are also satellite measurements, but these are looking at the sun, and these are measurements of the sun's energy output, a quantity called total solar irradiance. And you can nicely see this cycle here. That's um, the sunspot cycle. Uh, more sunspots, you have more um, solar irradiance, so more solar energy output. Uh, solar minimum here, fewer sunspots, fewer, energy out, output, and this is global mean temperature from thermometers and from satellites. So over the period we've actually monitored the sun's energy output from space, there's been no overall increase in that energy output, but the surface has continued to warm. And that's another fundamental difficulty 
independent of the satellite temperature data that you face if you posit all surface warming is due to the sun. Uh, may I ask a question on that on that graph? Sure, of course. Could you explain what you mean by surface temperature anomaly? Right. So typically, people define departures from some normal climate. So we look, for example, at 30-year periods. So most definitions of what is normal climate are over some 30-year period. Initially, when I started, it was 1960 through to 1989, and then it went 1970 through to um, <clears throat> 1999. And as the as the climate has warmed, as the mean, the average climate has warmed, the period the scientists use for defining anomalies or departures from normal has changed over time too. In this case, I think. The period that was used for defining these departures from normal is 1979, the beginning of the satellite record, through to 2017, which was the last year I analyzed here. So I'm, I'm looking at how different each year is from average conditions over this, over this period of time. So that's all anomaly means here. Okay, so it's sort of like a standard deviation. No, it's not. Um, a standard deviation would be if I looked at these departures, these guys here, and I calculated the standard deviation of these departures, okay. I'd have some measure of uh, their distribution. Oh, I see. Okay. This, Thank is, you. this is just the departures okay, from some normal conditions. We can also do what I just showed you in the atmosphere, in the ocean. This is from a paper led by my um, colleague, Tim Barnett, uh, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And this is looking in the ocean from the surface down to 700 meters. And what we did in this paper uh, that Tim led was to look at ocean temperature measurements from these things called bathythermographs that you throw over the side of the boat and uh, you make measurements as these things go down of ocean temperatures and salinity. And this is over the period, uh, roughly the second half of the 20th century. The same climate model from the National Center for Atmospheric Research that I introduced initially was used for performing these simulations in blue here where you don't change greenhouse gases and because of natural climate variability, you can get some cooling uh, or some warming. And the green envelope is when you run this parallel climate model with human-caused changes in greenhouse gases. Again, without doing any fancy statistics, it's pretty obvious that the surface warming, which um, gets smaller the deeper you go down into the ocean, is only captured when you increase greenhouse gases. It's not captured through natural climate variability. And you can look at this not only in the North Atlantic, but for every ocean basin. Here's the South Atlantic, for example, the South Pacific. And you can see that in the simulations and in the observations, because of different currents at different depths, sometimes the, uh, the observed temperature changes as you go deeper into the ocean are rather complex and actually this model does a creditable job capturing them. But the blue envelope, the nature only envelope with no changes in greenhouse gases, obviously doesn't do a, a good job, particularly in the upper ocean, capturing the observed warming of the oceans. So this is another sanity test, if you will. We look not only at one variable, we look at many different variables. One of the criticisms of the discernible human influence finding back in 1995 was it is primarily based on temperature, so look at other things, uh, convince us. And I'm reading here uh, <clears throat> a comment from one scientist made a couple of years after the IPCC's second assessment report was released. If there really is a discernible human influence on global climate, it should be evident in many different aspects of the climate system, not just in temperature. So what we did is we looked at water vapor, 
and in papers published in 2007 and 2013, we showed that there is a, a moistening of the Earth's atmosphere. As we're warming it, we're moistening it, and that moistening signal could only be explained by human-caused changes in heat-trapping greenhouse gases. Well, this is just a smorgasbord, if you will, of other papers that look not at temperature. I'm just highlighting them here. These are papers in the most prestigious scientific journals, Nature, Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Atmospheric Moisture Content, Human Influence on Global Precipitation, Surface Humidity, Runoff from Major River Basins, More Intense Precipitation, Heavy Rainfall, Surface Pressure, Moistening of the Arctic, Human Caused Changes in Stratospheric Ozone, Ocean Salinity, you get the picture. Scientists responded to that criticism of the second assessment report of the IPCC, you are only looking at temperature, by looking at dozens of different independently monitored variables. And that's where much of my confidence derives from, that we've moved well beyond looking at this only, to looking at atmospheric circulation, rainfall, humidity, you name it, snow and ice. And importantly, all of these things are independently monitored. This is not one group at Lawrence Livermore National Lab making these measurements. These are hundreds of groups around the world making measurements from the ground, from space, using weather balloons. And it's the internal and physical consistency of the story they are all telling us that is so compelling to me. Just finally, lessons learned. <clears throat> so as Bud mentioned, 1995, in November, the IPCC has been working for one and a half years on the second assessment report. The governments of the world, roughly 100 of them, and the scientists involved in the report meet in this beautiful Palacio de Congresos de Madrid with this wonderful Miro mural on the outside of the building. And at the end of the meeting, this is our bottom line conclusion. Again, these infamous 12 words, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. Like it or not, the buck stops with me. I'm the convening lead author of the chapter in the report in which this finding is situated. Uh, after the report was published, a lot of bad things happened. I was investigated by Congress. There were calls for my dismissal with prejudice from my position at Lawrence Livermore. It was rumored that I was going to be indicted by the Hague International Court of Justice for, quote, falsification of international relevant scientific documents, unquote. I learned a lot of powerful lessons. One was that the buck did stop with me. I was a representative of the scientific community. I did not have the luxury of retreating to my office, closing the door, curling up in a fetal position, and hoping that the bad stuff would go away. I had to explain what my colleagues and I had done, what we had learned, what the nature of the scientific evidence was that underpinned that discernible human influence conclusion, and I've taken that responsibility very seriously ever since. I'm just going to show you um, <clears throat> briefly these four lessons learned. One was defend scientific understanding. As I see it, there's no point in being a scientist if you're unwilling to stand behind the technical work that you and your colleagues do. Never engage in science by eminence of position. Trust me, I'm a scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. You're wrong. Do the science required to address the criticism. You posit that it's all the sun that explains surface warming? Well, let's look at that. Uh, you claim that the fingerprint is only detectable in temperature? We'll look at that, and we'll come back to you. And that's what we did, and I'm proud of that. Don't just preach to the choir. Much of my research was, almost all of my research, was funded by the US Department of Energy. I have to be accountable to the public to explain what we did with the funding we received, what we learned, and why it matters to others. And that meant that I had to go way, way outside of my comfort zone and often speak to audiences 
very skeptical about me and about everything that I do in order to answer their questions. And I'm going to show you one particular example of that. Uh, and then we're going to get to <clears throat> declaring your values. Yes? Yeah, well, we can get back to that a little bit later. Why, why um, did the science of climate change encounter such fierce opposition? Why does it still encounter such fierce opposition today? I think there are many different reasons for that. There's no one-size-fits-all answer. Some of it's ideological. Some of it is folks who want attention, quite frankly, and get it by being the lone wolf howling in the wilderness, claiming that they are the new modern-day Galileo. So there, there are many different reasons for opposition to science, but this, this, you know, these lessons are, are powerful. Alice, how much more time? Um... Uh, well, this would be a good time to take questions. Uh, well, if yeah, you're, you have a little bit more to. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I, I keep going. Keep going. Keep going? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, just, I just want to give you two examples. Um, one is of defending scientific understanding, and the other is of declaring your values. And just briefly, the defending, your, um, defending scientific understanding arose because in January 2017, um, former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, during his Senate confirmation hearing, made incorrect statements on the congressional record about satellite temperature data. And that's what my colleagues and I at Livermore did. We looked at satellite data. We were asked to comment on Mr. Pruitt's statements and we looked at all the satellite data in the world. We published a paper in Nature's Scientific Reports showing that Mr. Pruitt was demonstrably incorrect. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz had made similar claims about satellite temperature data and had claimed on late night with Seth Meyers at the beginning of his campaign for the Republican nomination for the U.S. presidency. Senator Cruz had also said that satellite data show no significant warming over some short period of time. And they had cherry picked. They had picked a particular short period of the satellite record in order to make these statements. So in fact, we published two papers, one in response to Senator Cruz, one in response to Mr. Pruitt. And after the Pruitt paper was published, uh, Seth Meyers contacted me and asked me to go on the program to set the record straight, to respond to Senator Cruz's claim about the satellite data. And if this works, I'm going to try playing you a roughly 90 second clip from this terrifying seven and a half minutes of a late night. <laughs> yeah, really, it was terrifying. This was way outside of my comfort zone. And if it takes a village to educate a child, it sure took a village of generous people like Bud to prepare me for those seven and a half minutes of pure terror. Here we go. You, you remain optimistic. And I'm happy to hear that, but where are you finding optimism right now, considering uh, the sort of uh, deck that's stacked against you? Well, it seems like a real teachable moment. Climate science has been elevated in public discourse. Look at that. Look at Senator Cruz appearing on your program, making testable claims. Uh, the President of the United States saying nobody really knows the causes of climate change. And we do. So this is a moment when people <laughs> When people are willing to listen, when I can come on your show and say, nobody really knows is wrong. It's fake news. Yeah. <laughs> so what I want, I want those teachable moments. I want to tell people, this is our understanding. These are the likely outcomes if we do nothing about the problem of human-caused climate change. And let's have a respectful, honest debate on what to do about it. But let's not dismiss this incorrectly as a hoax or a conspiracy. We all lose if we embrace ignorance with open arms. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And thank you so much for making the time. It's fantastic to have you here. Dr. Ben Sancher, everybody. We'll be right back.
values. So this isn't just a science problem. This is also a question about what we value as human beings. I declared up front, I'm not only a climate scientist, I'm also a climber. This is from Camp 18 on the Juneau Ice Field in Alaska. I've been privileged to do research there for about the last eight years or so. And over my lifetime as a climber in these beautiful, fragile, high alpine environments around the world, in the Alps, in the North Cascades, in the Himalayas, and more recently in Alaska in the Juneau Ice Field, I've witnessed profound changes in glaciers. One of the glaciers I stood on as an 11 year old kid with my dad near the Großglockner in Austria is now almost gone. We need to have some discussion not only about causation, not only about fingerprinting, but also about how we are diminished as humans if we lose these places or rainforests or coral reefs. What does that mean? Let's talk about those values as well as about the scientific values of getting the science right. So thank you very much. I, I'm so grateful that you gave up such a beautiful Sunday afternoon to listen to me drone on here. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Yeah, the April issue of Science talked about how global warming affects um, or sees increased CO2 affects nitrogen intake in plants. So consequently, we agriculture is used for nitrogen. And the thing about that is direct impact on everything we, we labor for, the bay and the nitrification of the bay. Yeah. Um, and the class of bottles that I mentioned, the ones with marine biogeochemistry, uh, with biogeochemical cycles, with interactions between carbon and nitrogen cycles, are capable of looking at those kind of interactions. And those more complete models enable us to get a window into the future uh, with all of the intended uncertainties in that window in terms of how these interactions between increased CO2 and warming and the nitrogen cycle may play out in the coming decades. Same with ocean acidification, which I would imagine is also an issue that's of some concern around here. Same with ocean warming. Uh, <clears throat> the challenge is to understand what is robust in the current generation of climate models and what is physically interpretable uh, so what is robust across a range of different models and what can we interpret in terms of simple physics and, and chemistry? Uh, that's the challenge uh, for climate scientists today. Yeah, first, uh, that was a magnificent presentation. Uh, that's the easy answer. I thought, in terms of property evidence, um, it, I thought I had read, maybe from a public or something, that we can actually label carbon to say which carbon actually contribution came from people, right. which say from permafrost or something. Is that true? That is true. Yeah. And just like I talked about fingerprinting mm -hmm. using temperature and using moisture, there's chemical fingerprinting. Yeah. So what does that involve? When we burn fossil fuels, so when we burn coal, natural gas, mm -hmm. There's a chemical fingerprinting that takes place between lighter and heavier isotopes of carbon. Um, you know, chemists refer to this as some fractionation process. And we know very well how that, how that plays out. And by looking, say, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, at this Center for Accelerator Mass Spectrometry, where you measure these different <laughs> isotopes, you can figure out very accurately how much of the CO2 increase from roughly 280 parts per million at the time of the Industrial Revolution to 420 parts per million today, how much is on us? And the answer to that question is about 75 to 80 percent of that increase is due to human-caused fossil fuel burning. And that is really very, very well understood and accepted science. Now folks, some folks would argue uh, and say that, well, we believe that CO2 increase, but it's all due to volcanoes. That's not true. Uh, actually, the volcanic 
contribution to that increase from 280 to 420 parts per million over the last 200 years or so is about 1% of the increase. So the chemical fingerprinting by looking at lighter and heavier isotopes of carbon, Bill McKibben is, is absolutely right. That was really, really important science. My husband says it's because there's too many people. Is it because Well, it's because of our emissions of greenhouse gases, largely. So um, <clears throat> we have changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere and those changes in levels of heat trapping carbon dioxide and methane and other chemicals like chlorofluorocarbons that don't occur naturally at all. They're on us, we produce them. Those are potent greenhouse gases too. And it's that change in levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases that is largely responsible for everything I showed you today. But would decrease number of people make a big difference? Well, uh, that's a big problem, right? population and figuring out what level of population is sustainable on this planet uh, clearly is part of the discussion and has to be part of the discussion. It's not an area in which I have any expertise. My expertise is the physical climate system. Um, that's where, where the boundaries of my expertise are. But clearly, we have to decide, uh, as humans on this planet, how are we going to use energy? What mix of energy are we going to use? Are we going to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases as we see the signal of serious impacts, changes in wildfire weather, changes in the intensity, severity, duration of heat waves, um, sea level rise? I don't see any changes in the positive What could we do differently? We could, make diff we could make different decisions about how to use energy and how much energy to use. And we could make different decisions about um, how much to invest in incentivizing new technologies. These decisions are something that we need to make on our watch, I would argue. And I would also argue that the countries and the companies that figure out cheap, efficient ways of providing low carbon energy are going to be the economic leaders of the 21st century. So the decision that faces us as citizens of this country, as I see it, is do you want to be a leader or do you want to be a follower? Yeah, well, I don't know what Yes, sir. Three other Nobel laureates kind of put us or set us on this path to increasing at read temperature and global warming. That would be Haber, Bosch, and Borlaug, because it was in those early days, early 1900, when they figured out how to turn air into fertilizer, and that's when the human population started to really accelerate. So we passed seven billion, and depending on the estimate, we will top out at between nine and 11 million. It, that's certainly part of the problem that this lady's talking about. Even with reduced carbon footprint, 11 million people is a lot. Which is why part of my answer was we need to figure out how to live sustainably on this planet. Elon Musk has an escape strategy. <laughs> I don't think most of us are going to be eligible for that escape strategy. More importantly, I have a son, <laughs> and he's going to grow up in this world. He's going to live and love in this world. I want him to grow up in a climate that is not spiraling out of control. I do not want to have a conversation with him 10, 20 years from now. Dad, you're a climate scientist. Why didn't you do more? You knew. You knew the likely outcomes. Why did you not do more to alert people to the credibility of the science, the, the reality and seriousness of climate change? That's part of my job too, to have these kind of discussions about the science, which is what I'm most comfortable with. But clearly, we also have 
to have discussions about population and use of energy and values, human values. What, you know, how are we diminished if we lose coral reefs and rainforests and glaciers? What does that mean? Nothing. You know, for most people I interact with, irrespective of their views on climate science, the loss of these things means something. The loss of the Chesapeake Bay, of its water quality, of the ability to fish, to do things you enjoy doing, that has some value. Um, losing that would mean something to you. So let's talk about that too. One more question. Yes? I don't think we're going to get anywhere until we educate our younger generations much more thoroughly than we are right now. I taught for science. This is where it's all coming from. It's treated as a freshman course in high school. The depth is not there for someone to understand what you just went over. Well, I agree. Uh, teach your children well. <laughs> you know, Bud and I have some familiarity with, and if we don't give kids in particular the understanding of basic science, if they don't understand what's stake, at, at stake here and, and what their role is in electing next generations of leaders, then we're going to fail. And I don't want us to fail. I'm involved with the National Center for Science Education. Uh, I have been involved with them for over 10 years. What they try and do is to ensure that climate science is well taught in our schools, which is a tough sell in certain states of this of this country. That do not. No, it is. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be. So that's the truth, and they try and ensure that every kid, no matter where they were born in this country, has access access to sound scientific information about climate change. And I, I would say, based on the surveying work that is regularly done in terms of how and how much climate science is taught in our schools, that's a tough job, but it's getting better. And just because it's tough doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of continuing to plug away. And that's what, as I said on Seth Meyers, I want. I want those kind of opportunities to speak in front of junior high schools and high schools, and I do that because ultimately they're going to be the next generation decision makers. Wow. Um, thanks, Ben. The one thing Ben didn't mention, I, I will mention. Uh, he had a top four years, uh, during, frankly, during the Trump administration. Um, the first word of advice that the Lawrence Berkeley lab to his office was uh, hide, basically, for four years. Uh, ben didn't do that. Ben went public. He did Seth Meyers. He wrote op-eds in major newspapers and lots of other journals. He's paid a major price for that. Uh, he, that's what has earned him his reputation as a defender of sound science. So, Ben, thank you so much for visiting us. And <laughs>